broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. <laughs> Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to the DB2 Night Show. This is episode number 212. I'm your host, uh, Scott Hayes, an independent entrepreneur and IBM Gold Consultant, and now a lifetime IBM champion. Today, our special guest is none other than my good friend, Klaus Brandt. He's also an IBM Gold Consultant, IBM champion and a really awesome teacher, and he runs the DB2 Symposium events. He'll probably tell you more about that. Today's topic is DB2 LUW SQL Tuning, how to detect, fix, and present, prevent, not present, prevent problems. More coffee, Scott. Klaus, how are you today? I'm absolutely fine. Congratulations on being a lifetime IBM champion. That makes two of us. <laughs> that, that is really awesome yeah that's a very small number of people in the world that have earned that recognition from ibm mm -hmm. so you got your uh, cup of tea ready yeah i i got uh, some some soda I, I know it's uh it's too early for beer and i know you like your tea and soda what soda are you drinking today it's a kind of cranberry kind of stuff oh something without exo without bubbles yeah okay well that's good let's uh let's get get the show going here show is your show follow us on twitter mention at db2 night show or at Klaus Brandt. that's how to engage us and we have a linkedin group that you can join kind of a, a social thing here Here's the show disclaimers. The DP2 Night Show sponsors advertise hosts and guests in their respective organizations. If any are not responsible for any liability or any content provided herein. Opinions and DP2 views are materialized in the viewer's mind only. Use information and ideas at your own risk. Use respect and courtesy when contributing to the DP2 Night Show via tweets, email, or as a guest. Trademarks, registered trademarks belong to their respective organizations. The DB2 Night Show is being recorded. Your participation may be recorded via your contributions, if any, and you can send to any all content being recorded via your ongoing participation. Mind your managed recordings and digital works that will be made available as replays, replays, blogs, and related show materials. Copyright 2019 TBI, all rights reserved. It's been a while since I zoomed through that. That's kind of fun. Tonight's show, we have a few quick announcements for you. We're going to talk about DB2 LUW SQL tuning. Thank you, Klaus, and some polling questions, and we'll wrap up like we always do. Upcoming events, probably don't want to miss this. Uh, DBI has a webinar this afternoon at 1 p.m. Central, 2 p.m. Eastern. It's scheduled for just 73 minutes. And the topic there is how to tune IBM DB2 LUW in minutes with confidence. So join that webinar. I, I believe they're, they're still giving away Amazon gift cards to attendees. So you actually get paid to learn, and that's pretty cool. Some upcoming shows to be aware of on the distributed database side. Uh, 29th of March, DB2 LUW Native Encryption with uh, Paul Bird. He's from the IBM Canada Lab. And on the 12th of April, we're going to have our annual All About IDUG show. That's going to be great, and it's going to be a great conference in Charlotte, North Carolina. 24th of May, we're going to have some breaking news from the IBM Canada Lab. And the 21st of June, that'll be the last show of our 10th season, and we're going out with a really big bang. I mean, a big one. Uh, Pavel Schuster from the IBM Canada Lab is going to come back and he's going to give us a three-hour class on DB2 
problem determination methods and techniques. So last show of the season is going to be a three-hour class from Pavel Schuster. Mainframe side, so save that date. We don't have it on the schedule yet, but save that date. Mainframe database, 15th of March, DB2ZOS batch system design for high performance with Neil Lozen, SoftBase, and the 26th of April, DB2ZOS latest news and future directions, Jeff Jostin from IBM. So lots of great shows on the horizon. Congratulations to Miss Shelley Liu at MetLife. She's in Cary, North Carolina. <laughs> I used to live there. Well, I used to live in Raleigh. Cary's a suburb of Raleigh. And Cary is an acronym. They called it the Centralized Area for Relocated Yankees. <laughs> <laughs> People moving, you know, from the north down to North Carolina. Uh, it's just funny. Anyway, she's won an Am uh, Amazon gift certificate. She was in show number 211, Favorite DB2 LUW Problem Determination Tricks with Pavel Schuster. She completed the survey after the show, and lucky her, her name came out of our hats, and we'll get that gift card and some others out soon. Ah, this is important. Perhaps you've seen this on social media, Twitter and LinkedIn. It's in different groups and whatnot, some of my posts. We're running a study on the state of the DB2 universe. We're trying to learn what are DB2 usage trends. Is DB2 growing? Is DB2 shrinking? Where is DB2 being used? What are DB2's most popular features and tools? And if we look at what's most popular, then we can infer what skills are needed to uh, utilize those popular features. How can IBM Labs improve DB2? What tech education should IDUG provide? Participants can win an IDUG badge or one of several Amazon gift cards. And uh, we're going to announce the winner of the badge on the All About IDUG show, April 12th. Also the gift card winners. The study will close on the 1st of April. So you have until the 1st of April to participate. But don't procrastinate. Uh, you can get to the survey very easily by going to bit.ly db2 study. That's a big D and a big S. And then all the other characters are lowercase. db2 study. Very easy to find. Maybe I'll put that in the chat as well so that you guys can find that and participate. Here's your giggle of the day. Be honest. Is this too much lettuce? Do you like burgers, Klaus? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's, the special ones uh, are, are really nice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's a monster. <laughs> but it might be too much lettuce. <laughs> All right. Yeah, well. We're not rabbits, are we? <laughs> <laughs> we're not rabbits. <laughs> that takes us uh, to Klaus. And <laughs> to, I think we'll tune. Let's make you the presenter, Klaus. And a little bit later on, we'll, we'll get to the break and uh, ask our polling questions and things. So click this okay. button, make you the presenter. Okay, let's see. I want screen number two. Okay, if I can see my screen. I can see your screen. It says, don't touch okay. my SQL at the top. Don't touch my SQL. I'm going to talk about doing some SQL tuning um, without changing the SQL. And, and is that possible? We'll, we'll see, but it's a real life situation because maybe you bought a package or, well, your relationship with the developers is not that good and you still want to, to improve uh, what's going on. So um, we first need to detect what's going on. So that will be the first part. And then the second part, we'll talk about fixing and even preventing that kind of problem uh, you might face. Uh, so let's, uh, I have a lot of slides, so let's move on very quickly. And standard disclaimer, not very interesting. Before I start, I always want to, to give a, a little bit of uh, food for thought. I recently ran into a lot of customers uh, who still have their uh, snapshots stuff all turned on. And uh, that's in your database uh, management uh, configuration, the DBM config. 
And that is actually driving overhead. Even if you don't take any snapshots, you still have a lot of overhead from the snapshots in DB2 itself. So if you don't use the snapshots, snapshots anymore, and you don't use DB2 top because DB2 top uses snapshots, then you're wise to turn it off. And in today's session, I'm going to talk all about the mongets. And the mongets are by default on. They're on in the database config. And as you can see, there are a lot of them. And they're typically set to base or off. The base ones, you a lot of them you can change into extended, but don't expect too much that you get so much more. Um, don't expect that if you turn off the mon gets that you are winning a lot of CPU or stuff like that. Maybe you say, I don't do any mon gets. Um, you should. Um, but if you turn them off, set them to none, then you're not saving a lot. That's not true for the ones who are off. If you turn them on, you are getting, uh, you, we will see that you are using slightly more CP really depends on what you're doing. So no snapshots anymore. Make sure that they're turned off. OK, back to the topic. First, we're going to talk about detecting problems. OK, and you probably detecting problems because you're getting bad signs. This guy is also seeing a bad sign. And the first one you really like to be noticed from is actually the monget functions. You you should set up some some regular monitoring, doing some mongets and and looking into what that produces. And it's not that difficult. Um, there are a lot of articles out there how to do that, how you can store the result of the monget into a history table, and maybe uh, download it, make some Excel graphs out of it, and and there's lots of interesting stuff you can do with the mongets. Sir. And of course, your second sign is, and that is uh, uh, not good if that happens, that you see that the response times are, are increasing. Maybe the run times of some batch-related work is, is definitely growing over time. Maybe your scheduler might have some nice statistics out of that. And uh, that is definitely a, a reason to make sure that you take action. The third one, uh, and, and the deeper where we get number three, it's more dramatic even, it's you're getting timeouts and deadlocks. That is really just the tip of the iceberg. If you think of it, if a timeout happens, that is a sign that there have been many transactions who got away with just not tripping that timeout. And maybe they, they were stuck for a long time. And uh, that might even come to point number four, that your users start to complain and say, well, what's going on? But by three o'clock in the afternoon, is the system is almost coming to a halt. And well, as soon as the, the customers start to complain that, then we really have problems, right? So we, we really would like first indications from number one, the reports in the Monget. Okay. Um, let's analyze a few things. DB2, what does DB2 do? DB2 processes SQL. And if you're, if, if you're accessing DB2 using SQL, um, it will do one thing and one thing only. It will either process what you are doing, and therefore it's consuming CPU, memory, I.O., and you must make sure that your server is in, in good shape. And uh, I would like to point back to the, the previous show, the show number 209, where I talked about uh, getting your server into good shape. And if everything's okay, then all of your processes are ready to go, you could say, and they can process. Um, consuming the resources. The other thing they can do is actually they can be in a wait. They're waiting for something. That is not that unusual. Um, databases have to do I.O. and I.O. takes time. Even if you go into an SSD, you take a few milliseconds maybe, and uh, then uh, that has to be put into the buffer pool, maybe decompressed, all kinds of stuff. You're definitely waiting for things. So there are two things which are very dominant in the wait. That's either the I.O. or you are waiting for locking or latching. And that means that you run into something which causes you to wait. And that might be that maybe a record, a row is being locked and you're waiting until another transaction releases that record and you can access that record also. And I'm going to show you how you can detect that. 
There is a very, very good article on the IDUC uh, blog. Um, it's written by Steve Rees, um, been here on, on the show many, many times. Unfortunately, it doesn't work in the Toronto lab anymore. But uh, when he worked there, there's the URL. I, I will make sure that you get uh, the PDF of uh, the handout so you can uh, just click on, on the URL. And that, that is definitely a must read article. He, he says you must ask yourself the right questions and start with question number one, are we spending our time inside DB2? Second question is, what is the, 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 the thing we're waiting for? And so on and so on. And as you can see, there, there are a few things which are not boiling down all the way to the end, which is that, is it the SQL? And that is that you have log weights or you have compile time weights. That is something which is a problem, but it's not at the result of an SQL statement, you could say. Um, the log should definitely be uh, performing very well. Again, look at uh, 209. Um, the compile time I'll talk about a little bit later on. Um, he introduces in that article a store procedure called DB summary, and you can just call that store procedure, give a number of seconds, and after a number of seconds, it comes back and it produces a long report, and it takes a little bit of study, but in that report, you can definitely, with the questions in that blog, you can definitely figure out is where actually is my problem. So that is, you have all the things at your fingertips, just run that DB summary, very, very good one. Okay, uh, um, are we waiting for somebody else? Are we waiting on a row which is being locked? And this is one of my favorite queries I like to do if I suspect that actually applications are blocking each other. And it goes to the monget apple log weights, that is another monget, and it produces a number of things. And as you can see over here, there is here a uh, lock name that is actually the, the record identifier. So it's, uh, it's, as you can see also here, table space number three, table number six, and then it's row number four, and that one is X locked and there are applications waiting on it. You can also see when the wait has started. Now, some applications actually have this, what they call a hot page or a hot record, which is a record or page which everybody would like to access. And that's not a very healthy thing, but that is very often also a design thing. So no matter what kind of SQL you have, if, if that is a hot page or a hot record, then, you have to go back to the drawing board. There is no simple solution for that. But at least you know it now that if you if you tap your enter key a few times in running that query, then you can see that if the same read pops up again and again and again, then you know you have a problem. Okay, well, we're not waiting. We're actually consuming resources. Then our first thing we have to ask ourselves is, what is actually bad SQL? Okay, it, it's a SQL that uses too much resources, you could say. Okay, well, what resources? Well, CPU, I.O., memory. Okay, good. Um, is, is, when does this happen? Well, it could be that, for instance, you have a bad server. Again, look at DB2 Nitro 209. Um, maybe it's the SQL statement itself. And, well, we could talk an all, a complete hour about how to design your SQL and, and how to make sure that you having the, the proper number of columns in, in the index, et cetera. But as I said in the beginning, very often the SQL is a given thing. So let's rule that out. Um, maybe it's the database design then. Okay, yes. There are a few things we can do about the database design. I'll talk about that a little bit later. And of course, the easy way out is always say, you say, ah, we're, we're low on resources, we're gonna buy a bigger machine. Well, hold on, hold on, hold on. I've, I've seen a lot of people buying into more resources, which actually they could tune their server, their SQL, their design a little bit, and the problem would go away. And that is also uh, what, for instance, uh, Scott monitors uh, do, uh, is, is the DBI monitor is, is um, um, actually uh, 
looking whether it can improve the environment a little bit so the SQL runs smoother, you could say. Okay, on that list is um, also the I.O. So do you have a lot of I.O. going on? That is a, something you can very quickly see from two MonGets. There's the MonGet table and there's the MonGet index. And both have in them lots of indicators. I made them red over here, which you can see definitely what are my hot tables, what are my hot indexes, and what are the folks doing in these, these uh, tables. So for instance, you can see uh, with the indexes that people have been doing lots of index scans, which can be also a sign that if the scan takes too long, for instance, then that's not a very, very healthy thing. I also made a few fields over here green, and that is because I'm, I'm gonna, when I'm coming to the run stats, I'm, I'm actually gonna talk a little bit more about, well, what are the criteria for a DBA to, to do that? If you wonder what that, uh, that picture is, this is uh, 1956, going back in time here. This is IBM shipping one of its first disk drives and guess what the capacity of the disk drive was. That's a five megabyte disk drive. Six guys have to lug it into, into the truck. But uh, yeah, but we've improved a lot. And I, I just uh, installed a one terabyte SSD in my own computer a couple of weeks ago. Okay. First, that's you would a, like that's to- That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool, eh? five megabyte drive. <laughs> so um, you, a lot of folks say, isn't there a simple thing to, to point out the application or the connection or, or the user who's consuming a lot of resources? And uh, well, to be honest, there is no command, just a simple DB2 command that does do that. I, I really would love that the people in the lab would improve list applications a little bit. And so I made my own list applications and I made it from the MonGet connections. And so it gives me an overview who's connected to, to the server. And um, I can also see um, how much CPU they've been using, how much time they've been waiting, how much time they spent on sorting. Um, if they are in a unit of work which is active at the moment, how long that unit of work has been going on already, how many logical reads, how many physical reads. This is like a DB2 top, if you, if you know the, 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 the top command from, uh, from Linux. This is a kind of top command now just for DB2. So this is a really cool one which you can do with the Mongat. So um, just plug that into a, into a little script and, and get the output from it uh, and, and think of that as, as being your list applications uh, um, or what list applications should have been. Okay, for those who've never been introduced into the bad SQL types, there are actually two types of SQL which are bad. And it's hard to say which one is more dangerous. Um, but there are two types, and that is the angry mosquitoes versus the uh, large angry elephant. So what is more dangerous, 10,000 angry mosquitoes who just uh, in one transaction what, just eats a tenth of a CPU second? Not too much really, huh? One tenth of a CPU second, who cares? But 10,000 times one tenth of a CPU second is 2.7 CPU hours. And if an angry elephant is marching through your server for half an hour, it just consumed half an hour of CPU. So don't dismiss these transactions, which are just consuming a tenth of a CPU second too quickly. The problem is that the elephant is very obvious and the mosquitoes are much harder to detect. But we'll see in a minute that we can definitely do something to detect our mosquitoes. Some of them at least. Okay, what are we going to do to, to find out what types of SQL we have and, and what's going on? Um, SQL, is, as it comes into the server, is being compiled by the optimizer and then the compiled result is 
stored into the package cache, a very, very important memory area inside DB2. So if you're wondering what's inside your package cache, just do that DB2 PD command over there. So DB2 PD minus DB sample minus dynamic, and you will see a dump of all your dynamic SQL statements which have been compiled and put away into the package cache. Um, this is the number one source for tuning because in the package cache, it not only stores that compiled result, but also statistics on how often the statement was being reused, how much CPU it, it used up to then, et cetera, et cetera. So that is a very, very important one. And you can get the results out of the Mongat package cache statements. That is yet another Mongat. Um, don't go to these old sys IBM ADM uh, snap dynamic SQL and long running SQL. They've been known to produce incomplete and incorrect results. So the snapshots are actually not being maintained anymore. So always go for the Mongat. The package cache is so important that actually you should not allow STMM to snoop memory away from the dynamic statement cache. Um, you really would like the package cache to have a fixed size at startup so you can store lots and lots of statements in them. Um, so make it large enough and make sure that you fix it. I agree totally with Amber. If there's one area you should fix, it should be the package cache. Oh, am I going forward or backward? Okay, talking about our dear Amber, um, she wrote in a blog once a very, very nice uh, statement doing on the Mongat package cache, a first a, a totaling, a summary, uh, a sum of all the very important areas and then goes with the results back into the package cache again. So if you don't understand that SQL, don't really think too much about it. It's um, it's a very well complex SQL, you could say. Um, but what happens here is at the top, we, we get the totals and then with the totals, we go back into the package cache and we are looking for the, the top 20 SQL statements, which are either uh, reading too much uh, or are taking too much CPU or are, are very long in the execution time or very uh, lot of time in the sort, et cetera, et cetera, or have been executed a lot. So we're taking uh, the, the, the ones which are the problem ones. And for instance, so if you have an SQL statement, a mosquito, which is being used a lot, then it might come up as being one of these at the bottom here, the number of executions is very high. And so that is uh, something we really would like to look into. Okay, good. We, we at least found a way to, to get our SQL, which is trouble SQL, you could say. I get a question very often from customers who say, can we actually trace our SQL? I really would like to have a trace to see what that application is doing. And the answer to that is yes, but it takes a little bit of fiddling around because it, you need to start an event monitor and you need to instruct the workload manager to say, to kick it and say, hey, that application over there, I really would like you to, to record what it's doing. And it's not difficult. Um, there is actually on developer works, again, a URL here at the bottom, uh, yet another article uh, interesting to read. There is a, a, a very good uh, uh, explanation on how that works and they've put it all into some nice store procedure. So if you download that SQL file, install it into your DB2, then you can actually, by calling a store procedure, you can turn it on. And then uh, when you, you're done with your testing, you, you ask just by a select statement, select from SQL trace dot trace, and it dumps out which SQL statements have been processed, how many times they've been executed, how much CPU in total each of the statements have been, been consuming. So actually very, very nice. This is different from the package cache because in the package cache, it could be that one of the 
SQL statements, which was just used once, but did take a lot of CPU, is kicked out again uh, within a few minutes because uh, there was not enough space and new compiles are coming in. And so this was just a single statement. So it wants to kick it out and say, make some room for a new statement. Uh, that is something you don't miss by doing this workload manager approach. The overhead of the workload manager is zero as long as you're not tracing and we're turning the trace on just for a very specific application. And even then for that application, the overhead is not that big. So it's a very safe method of doing it. Um, the other thing you can do is to use a tool which actually comes with DB2 and that's called DB2 batch. I know it's, a, it's, it's getting old uh, and I say that it's getting old because it uses snapshots internally. It's one of the tools which have not been yet, hint, hint to the people in Toronto, has not been yet converted to the MonGet. It would be really nice if we have a new DB2 batch with some MonGets in there. Um, what is done in the DB2 batch? Well, DB2 batch has a philosophy. It says we are actually preparing a statement. So that is the compile time. And then we're executing the statement. And then once the result is ready from the statement, we need to fetch the result back to the application. Each of the three could actually be a problem. So it measures that very, uh, at, at that very level, it says, well, how much time did you spend on the prepare? How much time on the execute and how much time on the fetch? That's very, very nice, actually. So what you need to do is you need to have a, a small file with your SQL statements, which are inside your program. And maybe you, you just design a new transaction and you could have that as a kind of, what if the transaction would have these SQL statements in them? How much CPU time would that consume? And do we need to change maybe something? Do we need to tune something? Yeah. So it's a benchmarking tool. And that actually needs a number of parameters on the command line. I've highlighted the ones which are important. Um, the isolation level is by default repeatable read, which you probably would like to turn that back to uh, cursor stability. Um, you really would like to have uh, the, the most complete output. So you must, in the minus I, the format, you must say complete. And in the options, you really would like to say that you are not really um, taking all the rows back, and but you really also, while you are executing, you would like to take some snapshots. And that is uh, done with the command parameters. And as you can see, the default is that you are just measuring the elapsed times. But if you turn that up one more and uh, put in number two for uh, that parameter, then you are actually also taking application snapshots. Um, and that is also giving you lots and lots of very good information. Of course, it is possible that if you are mimicking a kind of batch program that you say, well, but here actually the program comes into a loop and this statement will be executed maybe a thousand times. Um, that is something you can also do in, in the input of db2batch. You can actually wrap one or more statements into a block and then say how many times the block has to be executed. Maybe you say, well, um, we are doing SQL the proper way and we're using uh, the markers inside the SQL. We prepare the statement and then we are executing it by giving the values uh, during each execute. Also, that is something DB2 batch can do. You can uh, make a parameter input file and use the parameter markers. So you are really, really mimicking what an application is doing. And it would be really wise to do a little bit of upfront uh, testing with DB2 batch if you are in the design phase. And otherwise, um, this is also a, a tool which, if you are doing it correctly, can point you very quickly in one of those things to uh, the, the SQL statements inside a program, which is the curl bit, you could say. Um, think of that also where we captured that, that SQLs from the workload manager. You could take that as input and put the SQL statements into db2batch to do a little bit of more investigation. So this is what the input, for instance, looks like. And then at the bottom, I put the db2batch here, db2batch for database sample. This is the input file. 
isolation cursor level, uh, cursor stability, uh, complete information. This should be the output file, and this is the extra parameters for getting the application snapshots. So that is uh, also a very useful tool to do detect where our problem is. And that is, this is a little bit of sampling what you can expect um, on the output side of things. So that is, uh, that is very good. Very, very nice utility. I like DB2Batch. Oops. Oh, we're, we're going the, the wrong way. Yes. Where are we? <laughs> Here we are. Um, Scott, is this a good month for the break? We can do it now. Yes, we can. Yeah, sure. Then we're going to talk a little bit about fixing the, the things. Okay. okay, let's ask some polling questions. What DB2 LUW versions are you currently running? This is a terrific way to collect information, quick poll about what's going on in the DB2 community. Your participation is appreciated. We'd like to see at least 80% of our good looking audience vote. And we'll usually let these things go for 30 seconds or 80%, whichever comes first, give or take. Anybody else want to vote on this? Going once, going twice. Closing the poll, sharing the results. And we've got version 11, just barely edging out 10.5. And 21% on 10.1, 33% with 9.7. And amazingly, 21%, over a fifth of our audience is 9.5 or earlier. Now, some of those older releases are just really... Really fantastic, and people can't let go of them. Or their vendors aren't keeping up. What operating systems do you run DB2 on? Used to be, years ago, we could always count on AIX being the winner, but lately, x86 Linux has been dominating. We'll see what today's audience says. A good size audience today. few more seconds to participate. Going once, going twice. Closing the poll and sharing the results. And today AIX is the winner at 78%, followed by 73% with x86 Linux. 35% on Windows. Got a good showing for Z Linux and 8% Linux on power. Next polling question. Kind of a fun question. We are, recently we started here in our 10th season, we started putting uh, replays of the show on YouTube. And so are you, are you watching on YouTube? Have you subscribed to our channel? Once you get to a certain number of subscribers, that gives you credibility in the eyes of the YouTube Google world. And they let you do more fun, exciting, and helpful things with your channel, like a custom vanity URL and other things. So we're really keen on growing the subscriber count to that YouTube channel. Going once, going twice. Closing the poll, sharing the results. 11% have subscribed, 74%, not yet, but we'll check it out. 13%, old school, and I download the replays. You know, downloading the replays works really well if you're flying on airplanes. That's, that's still a good idea. 8%, YouTube is prohibited at work. 5% was YouTube. Oh, you, you folks are funny. Are you using DB2 in that fluffy cloud thing? 
AWS cloud, IBM cloud, another cloud. Not yet considering in the future, no way, no how, not for us, not going to go there. This is this has been interesting to watch this this adoption of cloud uh, it works for some organizations for others maybe not so much I don't know I've been working with DB2 in the cloud since uh, the mid 1990s I used to have a server at my desk AIX and I'd log into the console and then they moved the server down the hall to a closet. It wasn't at my desk anymore. It was an IP address somewhere not at my desk. That's a server in the cloud. Of course, it was on the local LAN, but it's not at your desk. It's in the cloud. Okay. Going once, going twice. Closing the polls. Sharing the results. 3% AWS, 8% IBM, 8% another cloud, 50% thinking about it, and a third say, not our gig. We have one more polling question. Are you using DB2 Peer Scale? Version 11 made Peer Scale a lot easier to use. It was mind numbingly difficult back in uh, DB2 10.5 and earlier. Peer Scale is uh, some really great technology if you're looking for super uber high availability. You might also get a little performance boost from it as well. Going once, going twice, going to close this poll and share the results. 3% of today's audience is using it, 28% thinking about it, 69% no need for their particular application. Okie dokie. So that's it for the polls. A quick commercial break from today's sponsor, DBI Software. DBI offers smarter tools for smarter people. I'd like to point out that DBI has been recognized now six years in a row by Database Trends and Applications Magazine as a trend-setting product. And I, I kind of uh, Google around myself and I'm looking to see, well, what about other tools? And I don't see the same recognition and awards for other tools in the industry, so that's that's real nice. Some DBI PureFeet top advantages. Uh, DBI does offer the lowest overhead in the industry. Some benchmark information that were sent by customers showed that uh, the overhead of uh, an ISV, uh, a tool provided by IBM, uh, was eight times higher than DBI's overhead. Uh, DBI offers very meaningful trend charts with history plotted on the charts so you have the context of what's happening and, and why things might be going up and down on your charts. There's advanced index benefit analysis that shows you if multiple index indexes are recommended by the advisor. Uh, which of those indexes provide the most value. There's also predictive index impact analysis where you can ask, well, what happens if we actually create this index? How many SQL will improve, stay the same, and will any degrade? And that's super powerful and really important. You have the focus with DBI on relative weights and costs, and this helps you find real root cause problems in just a couple of mouse clicks. And there's also very robust, extensible lights out alerting. Take this opportunity again to remind you, DBI does have a webinar this afternoon. Uh, look for it on DBI's events page. Register and attend. And DBI is providing Amazon gift cards to attendees. So you actually get paid to learn about how to do DB2 performance tuning. And it's not time to wrap up yet. Instead, we're going to make Klaus your presenter. Let's get Klaus back on. Klaus, are you ready to go? Yep, I am. All right, I'm making you the presenter. Okay. Here we go. I just opened up uh, the web browser to look at uh, the DB2 Symposium for this year. Um, it's an, a training event which happens in Europe. Um, and it, it is different from conferences 
that is that the each of the sessions is actually a, a full day class and that goes on for several days and you can join us for one day two days three days whatever uh, you you like to do uh, depending on your budget on your needs um, and this is uh, what we have in mind for this year um, and I've already got some compl uh, some some uh, remarks from people saying it's a very uh, very good program this year um, as you can see uh, it's three days long at the Monday we have a, a welcome keynote which is not announced yet but that's for the people who check in in the hotel early and then to e each day we have, have uh, two ZOS sessions and one LUW session and so we uh, have uh, on the Tuesday and um, that's quite interesting for the LUW people we have um, a session on the DB2 analytics accelerator for ZOS that is a, a box which you plug into the mainframe and guess what's running in that accelerator do you know Scott I'll bet it's DB2 LUW it's nowadays DB2 LUW you then it used to be in a teaser machine and now it's it's DB2 LUW so DB2 LUW speeds up the mainframe when it comes to analytic queries to data warehouse queries so that's quite interesting uh, we have got Susan Lawson we got Alan Lee from uh, from the lab he's going to take a peek under the hood of DB2 LUW and talk about uh, all of the the things coming in the next releases um, I'm going to talk about actually I'm going to do a workshop um, building and debugging uh, SQL PL store procedures so you you bring your laptop and we're gonna gonna build some store procedures and uh, on the LUW side as well uh, Christian Malaro um, who works both on the mainframe and uh, on LUW he's gonna talk about what's new from 10.5 on so you're up to date again with uh, with all the the cool features so great program great location people always uh, love that uh, a lot um, it's a it's an old uh, monastery uh, um, which is turned into a hotel and uh, so we're going to sit outside as well and have some drinks um if you're in europe definitely you should consider it I, I okay. attended that uh, once. I was a speaker for you at that location, and I can affirm and attest that it is indeed a beautiful facility. And it is very nice. There's even some nice walking trails nearby. Oh yes, it's in the middle of the forest. It's 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 so cool. There was a, <laughs> a question on one of your earlier slides, if if I might inject it now, uh, regarding slide 17 and the overhead disclaimer. What exactly is meant by WLM not producing data? Is the trace not producing data if it is? And if you okay. want to address that now. Yes, that, that's a very good question. Um, the workload manager is a component of DB2, which is always on. There's something you cannot turn that off. And if you turn on an event trace for activity, actually the event trace is just sitting there doing nothing and you can say to the workload manager you can give it an instruction and you can do that in several ways you can do it for a certain type of workload you can do it for a single application handle and that's what what that, that is on the slide it just points to one, one application and say for this application you should start tracing and for this application it produces then overhead uh, the other applications just run at the same speed as before um, it's not that the overhead is big and, but you can make the overhead big but if you say well we're going to trace everything from everybody whoa then then you you're in for some uh, some overhead but if you do it just very focused on a single application uh, on a single connection then the overhead is very limited if you just turn on the event trace by itself and never give the instruction to trace then actually the overhead is zero you cannot turn off the workload manager so yes maybe there is some overhead we will never know but the workload manager is always there no matter what type of license you have so um that's so a, that that that's a great probably, answer class okay for, cool. for, that, for that you get a drum roll yeah <laughs> Okay, let's see what we can do if we have problems to fix them and maybe prevent for the future uh, of uh, what 
problems we are going to get. Okay. Uncle Bob is back, Bob Sabitas, and he, I, I asked him, is Dr. Bob, what can you tell us about fixing problems? And here's Dr. Bob's advice. He says, bad SQL cannot be fixed with more hardware. So think of it that if you have actually an SQL problem, then, and Scott can probably confirm this, you can give it more hardware and the bad SQL will just consume that as well and give it more hardware and then also the bad SQL will consume that again. Isn't that true, Scott? Yes, sir, that is absolutely true. <laughs> so, you know, yes, na so nature, nature abhors a vacuum. And if you have <laughs> problematic SQL in the database, it doesn't matter how much hardware you throw at it, uh, you're just going to keep pouring money into that. It's no good. There you go. So we must fix that. Okay, what can we do to fix it? Well, maybe you can do a quick fix. Sometimes it's because wrong decisions have been made, and that's because the run stats wasn't there. Maybe the data is not in such good shape. Um, I've seen people who actually changed their clustering index and then from that moment on started to complain and said, well, what is happening here is this? And well, guys, you, you changed the clustering order, um, but you, you never reworked it to, to get to that new clustering order. So do a quick rework, run a good proper run stats, what that is we're gonna talk about as well, and see if the problem is going away. I'm not telling you that this is snake oil, but it's definitely worth trying. Um, and it's a, typically a kind of quick fix. Good. Back to our mosquitoes. It could be that the mosquitoes are coming from an application which we call stringers. These applications string their SQL together in that they actually produce a long string with all the literal values in there and then present it to DB2. And DB2 says, hmm, that statement's not in the, in the, the package cache. Let's compile that and puts it into the package cache. And then they come with a new value, but the statement's the same. And as the example here on the slide, just the employee number changed. And then DB2 says, hmm, that's weird. I don't have that statement. And it compiles it again. And I can tell you, if you have STMM on and you allow the package cache to be tuned by STMM, I've seen package caches which just blow, being blown out of proportion into the gigabytes and, and just because of these statements coming in all the time. So if that's the case, if you bought an application which is one of these bad guys, then you might turn on the statement concentrator. By default, it's off. It's in the database config and you can set it to literals. That means that it will strip out all the literals out of the SQL and then act as if the statement is being prepared and being executed with values. And because the literals are stripped out, it can recognize actually that the statement is in the package cache. Um, it is typically, they've warned in the past that it is for a transaction environment don't use the statement concentrator for data warehouse kind of queries, very complex ones where you join lots of tables together, etc. cetera. Um, because in the past, we've seen that statements have suffered an uh, SQL minus uh, 119, um, which is very weird because that has nothing to do with, with these literals, um, has something to do with a group I, which is not there or something. Um, um, but that was a fact, and hopefully all these, these problems are fixed, but the true value is actually indeed in transaction fixing. So if you, if you bought one of these applications which is doing that, then this might be a good solution for you. Okay, next one on the list. Make sure that currently committed is on. Since 9.7, it's the default for new databases, but as we've also seen in the polls today, people are still on old releases, they migrate, the database has been built in 9.5 or 
and has been migrated all the way up to 11 maybe. And it might be that currently committed is not on for the database. So I have mixed emotions on, on, on the currently committed. It can turn against you as well, but that's a very weird case where that happens. Um, in 95% of all cases, it is actually a very, very good thing. And that means that when DB2 is scanning through data and it bumps into a lock, which is not the data you are looking for, but that means that you have to wait. Then from that point on, these are being skipped. And um, it, to evaluate what's going on, DB2 for every lock, locked row, it will go back to what is currently committed for that row. So that is a very long story. It mimics a little bit the behavior of Oracle. And uh, I hate to say it, but maybe the Oracle implementation on, on locking was slightly better. <laughs> so currently committed is actually a very good thing. And I've seen many locking problems going away because of current, current commit being on in the database config. So check whether it's already on. If you've defined your database in 9.7, and higher, it probably is already on. Okay, if we are doing data warehouse, I've seen people struggling with data warehouses and queries which took forever and doing MQTs and, and long running loads and, and huh, it's, it's amazing. Um, let's just make a simple rule. If we're doing data warehousing kind of queries, then use blue, period. But maybe you say, well, you know what? We have a mixture of transactions and data warehouse. Okay, yes, um, that is what IBM calls HTAP, the hybrid transaction and analytics processing. And that is an evolving world. It is, it is being improved over the years and, and we will see new improvements, but at the moment it is possible to have both blue tables and traditional tables together in one single machine and keeping them in sync, et cetera, et cetera. But that, that takes a little bit more setup. But if we're just talking about pure data warehouse, that's a no brainer, go to blue. It, you will thank yourself for it. The other nice thing is, but I dimmed it out a little bit, is that you can get a very special license for the blue. I dimmed it out because one, I don't, I hate talking about licenses and B is that um, these, these offerings typically go away after some while. Uh, but just, you need proof of concept. The new analytics processor for the mainframe is actually running blue tables. So there you go. Um, if that isn't proof of concept enough, then I don't know. Okay, well, that is, uh, also a quick fix then. Then our beloved friends, the object relational mappers. And we can say a thousand times that they're bad, that they're evil, we can make jokes with them, that we have Darth Vader here with Mickey Mouse ears on, and uh, there, there are all kinds of, of object relational mappers, and typically they are a source of problems. But this is the show where we say, we have to live with it. We have to live with the SQL. We have to live with the Hibernate, for instance. Hibernate is the number one object relational mappers. What I don't understand is that people are using a piece of technology which they don't understand themselves, as if they're going to work with a lunar rocket or something like that. It's like, I don't know, if, but if I push this button, then it will bring me to work. Um, yes, it has some slight implications. That's bad, we shouldn't do that. Um, you should actually educate yourself. And also, Hibernate can be used and can be tuned. That's the good news. Well, there's this guy from Germany, Torben Janssen, and he runs a very nice website called Thoughts on Java. Most of the stuff which he publishes over there, I don't understand, but for the Java people, it, it makes very good sense. And he also wrote a book, which you can buy for $21, I think, and to tune Hibernate, etc. But also on this page, the URLs on, on the slide, he has a YouTube video with seven tips 
on boosting your Hibernate performance. Uh, so there is some good news, and that is you can actually turn Hibernate into your friend. Sometimes it, it is not your friend at all, but if you push the right buttons and if you stroke it the, the right way, it will become your friend. So do that. Make sure that you do that. It, it's what's $21 for getting a better performance, you could say. Next one up, database design basics. I'm always amazed that people do not take care of their implementation of their design. Hopefully they did proper design, they, they've come to the, the third norm form of the data and they do translation back to physical design, et cetera, et cetera. So rule number one, every table must have a primary key. That means that every table in your DB2 must have a unique index, which is the primary key index. If that's not the case, then that's very weird. I don't care if you don't call it the primary key, as long as that index is there. If the unique index is missing on a table, if it has indexes, but none of them are unique, I get this weird feeling that there is an M to N relationship which has not been properly designed and they will allow for duplicate keys. And that is very weird because that will definitely produce some performance problems. Rule number two, all foreign keys must be indexed. And maybe you say, well, but, but wait a minute, we, we're not using referential integrity. Yes, you are. It's a relational database. So that means that you have foreign keys, you have primary keys. Maybe you don't name them that way in your DDL, but you still have them. And if there's a foreign key out there, which is typically the, the ones which are in the join. So if you have a foreign key, you must put an index on them, always. That means that the majority of your joins will go back to nested loop joins, which are the most performant joins. So if you have hybrid joins, for instance, and that is because it's a join with a foreign key which is not being indexed, then this can be your very quick solution. Just check your, your database design and make sure that all your foreign keys are actually indexed. And the data types of primary and foreign keys must be definitely equal. And no decimal five with a decimal six joining, et cetera, et cetera. That is bad practice. That is a lot of overhead and also is pushing the optimizer towards tricks, which you don't want. So make sure that your data types are always equal. And if you change a data type, always think of what the implication is, where it should be changed as well, right? So, well, talking about the design, it, maybe it should be on the wall, but maybe maybe just in your drawer or whatever, but somebody should have a referential layout of your design so you understand your database. Back to the indexes. A table should not have too many indexes. I always say to the customers, one to three is great, Four to five is okay, six to eight is hmm, but eight, nine and more is too much. Exceptions to the rule, of course, but in general, nine or more is like, what are you doing here? Are you just throwing in more indexes to hopefully improve performance? That's not a good idea. So make sure that you keep your indexes limited. Why? Indexes are overhead, every insert, causes a lot of updates in, in indexes. So if you have too many indexes, then the overhead becomes uh, noticeable. So you could say that, so make sure that you have those. Um, also have a look at the non-unique, non-foreign key indexes. So the non-unique, non-foreign key indexes and the ones which are not being used for X number of months that you can see in syscat indexes in the last used, uh, date at uh, the column, uh, there should be a date in there. And, and if that is very long ago, then this index actually is not interesting for DB2 and you should get rid of it. Hopefully that doesn't hurt any other process, but I can't think of it if it's a non-unique, non-foreign key index. Um, 
Tables are typically random, pretty sequential, or a mix of those. You can see that from the MonGet tables. Uh, so that's also one thing you should really understand is with what type of tables are we dealing with and um, how much I.O. am I expecting on these tables. Uh, so if there's a spike that you can actually detect that. So a history of what the MonGet tables is producing is always useful. Why should you know what type of table you have? That's because of the compression. I've seen customers who say, oh, compression is a great thing. It, it's cool and it, it produces actually, uh, they say it's, it's good for performance. No, it's not. If you have a random table, which you are just, take, you are coming in via a key and you're, you are picking out a single row. And if that is compressed, then actually the decompression should be done. Well, you say for a single row, the decompression is not that high. Correct. For a single row, it's not that high. But if you compress your table, you are also compressing your indexes. And if you compress your index, then the decompression of the index page has to be done before the page can be used. So it's not a single row anymore. It is putting a complete index page together again. And that takes overhead. So don't compress everything, compress where it makes sense. And that, that is the, the sequential type of tables, which you actually also are using sequentially, then it makes sense. Okay. Well, to be expected, right? Class just said, don't create more indexes. And here he comes. Well, how about the design advisor asking the design advisor for some indexes, right? Of course, it could be that you are producing SQL, which needs an extra index. As long as we don't go overboard, and if you look at the slide with the, with the indexes on there, it also says maybe you can combine indexes by include columns, et cetera. So that is also something. And also you should also look at on how much, uh, how many uh, columns are used in the index. The, the used columns should always at the beginning, right? So. Um, so the design advisor is, is a uh, piece of software which you are throwing in, again, SQL. And again, we've seen how we can get our SQL. And you throw that into the design advisor and that comes up with uh, some advice, right? So that is, uh, and um, how does that work? Well, um, you say a database, a file with some SQL statements, in the file, you can again also mention, unfortunately, different syntax than DB2 batch. You can also mention that there is a frequency, um, how often this statement is being used. And um, you give that into uh, the a design advisor and it comes up with some advice on uh, what indexes should be created according to the design advisor. Now, there is some bad news about the design advisor. There are two bad things about it. One is garbage in is garbage out. Meaning that if you are not giving the design advisor all of the input which is it needs, it will still come up with an advice. The other thing is the design advisor does not look at the implications of the new index. So it doesn't calculate with how about how this workload gets worse because of the new index. And the third thing is that actually the design advisor very often comes up with multiple indexes, right? So that is, um, now I have a problem, which one to pick? Well, um, that is, that is a, a, a art by itself. Amber blogged about it. Scott gave presentations about it. Actually, Amber blogged about Scott. Um, Scott gave a very good presentation at IDUC about how these multiple indexes, how you pick the best index from the design advisor. So um, look at Ember's blog if you really need an, an, an understanding what that was about. Um, but it's not an easy thing. It's, it's, um, you should actually, well, it takes a lot of, um, not guesswork, but it takes a lot of studying, et cetera, et cetera. It's not that you say, well, uh, like you do with the monitor is that you point to to some SQL and say, hey, how about this one? And so you, you, you're you done in a few seconds where 
if you do it all by hand, it takes you a long time. But it is possible. So design advisor can be your friend, but it takes some studying and it takes some getting used to what the design advisor actually is and how it works. Then we have the run stats. Run stats is very, very, very important because this is the source of the decisions made by the optimizer. It needs to have proper run stats. I think it's your responsibility to do the run stats, not DB2s, as we will see in a minute. So when do you do your run stats? Well, of course, when you created and loaded things and reorg things, but also when you had many changes, like more than 10% of the rows have changed. And also when you install some new software, a new release or a new fix pack, I always rebind everything which is static. Um, which is typically with the SQL PL, and um, also uh, do the new run stats when I do a new release or fix back. Do not do run stats because it's Sunday. That is so silly, is that this like, uh, you, you are wasting a lot of resources um, and you're not producing any better results. So you need to have a reason to do your run stats, right? So that is, uh, and that is that there has been changes going on. So maybe you say, well, me so lazy, isn't there something in DB2 autonomic computing and automatic statistics? Yes, there is. That is actually in the database configuration. And if you are creating a new database, it actually is on. You might want to turn it off because it does do bad things. Why is it doing bad things? Well, for one, they run seven by 24 unless you set up you set up some policies then you can push it into a window but if you don't set up the, the policies it runs in your prime time it actually runs together with the applications and although it can only run one at a time it still is noticeable definitely when you are just crashed and you see that you are starting up and then within five minutes boom it's back again so there's no way you can prevent that there's no way you other than just turn the whole thing off. The other thing is, it doesn't produce the run stats I want to have. It picks some run stats, and if it then thinks that it can improve on that, it might run run stats again. So that is not very good. The third reason is that it interferes with me being the DBA. I've been into many situations that I wanted to, to do a reorg, and I ran into the run stats being active on the same table where I wanted to do a reorg. So it's, it's, it's in the way, it's uncontrollable, and it doesn't produce the results I really would like to see. So turn it off, and if you really would like to have a, an, an, an interesting read, uh, see what the, these uh, real-time statistics do, and then you definitely want to turn it off. Real-time statistics are a bit weird on what they do. So run stats is something you do yourself, right? So you run stats on a table with distribution and sample detailed indexes all. I know it's a heavy one, it's a heavy banger. And to make sure that we're not producing too much CPU, then we make sure that we're doing sampling. So you can say sampling of 20% is safe. Uh, you just have to pick your type of sampling. The sampling can either be Bernoulli or system. And people really don't understand what the difference is and it's quite easy. The Bernoulli just counts rows and says, I'm taking 20% of the rows. So if you say 20, then one out of five rows will be looked at. So it goes through the table and looks at all the rows. Whereas the system one says, I'm skipping pages and I'm taking one out of five pages at 20%. In general, the system one is the bad one, in general. Why? Because it looks at all the rows of a single page and the locking problem is more likely with the system one than with the Bernoulli. The chances of running into a, a very small lock is with the Bernoulli less than with the system one. So I always go for the Bernoulli. The results of this thing is the same and the amount of I.O. is also the same because it will 
for both of them do prefetching on getting the pages. So, so what is this distribution stats and why is it so important? Well, look here at the picture, right? This is the New York Marathon. Maybe you see Scott there in the middle. That's because he runs in the New York Marathon. In the New York Marathon, you have 105,000 participants. And well, I'm, I'm, I'm an old fashioned guy. How many genders do we have? Two, right? Male and female. And that is in the table of the marathon. And if you would say, what is the cardinality two? So that means that how many, according to the optimizer, how many are male? You would come up with 50% is male. That is not true. Actually, in the New York Marathon, 40% is, um, is female and 60% uh, is male. There's slightly more males running than females. It's a deviation of 20%, which is okay. That's why I made it green. Okay, cardinality of the nationality. That's 100. So how many Americans participate in the New York Marathon? Ha, that's simple. That's one divided by 100 is 1%. Wrong. 70% <laughs> of the participants is from the US. So that's a deviation of 7,000%, which is totally off. That's why we need distribution statistics. The distribution statistics takes care of the frequent values and takes care of what we call the quantile. And they're different. The frequent values actually uh, counts the values which are most often there. And then it says, well, uh, this one is seen so many times, this one is seen so many times. And you might say, well, what I'm querying is actually not in that list. So what is that list good for then? Well, think of this, that you, if you have the top three, and the top three is red, green, and blue, and you come with yellow, well, yellow is not in the top three, but the optimizer can see that if red, green, and blue together are already 90%, yellow can never be more than 10%. So even stuff which is not in the top is actually good to know that it's not in the top, so it, it is in the remaining part. The quantiles are a little bit different, is that is as if we put all the um, values in a single line and then say, where are we at 5% and where are we at 10% and so on and so on. This is really cool for queries with bigger than and less than and in between. So we can see where we are in this, this long thing here. And we say, well, we are, are actually almost at the end and what you are doing with uh, bigger than Connor, although Connor starts with a C, bigger than Connor is only 6% of the whole list. So that is actually what the quantiles can be very helpful with. Make sure that if you create a new index that you are also straight away asking for the run stats on the index. Make sure that if you run utilities that you are actually doing the with the utility or actually straight after the utility so you are actually uh, producing the correct results. Do not run run stats to make your decisions on doing reorgs as being a DBA. Why? You've made the decision that you want to reorg because of bad statistics, but now you have a system with bad statistics until you've done the reorg. If you go back to the ones where I had the, in the SQL in, in blue, then you will actually uh, see some very nice things in Monget, which you can also make decisions on to do reorganizations without running any run stats at all. Okay, so to summarize, to fix and prevent problems, statements concentrator, if we have string SQL, make sure that currently committed is on. Data warehouse queries belong on blue tables, understand your hibernate and make sure that you are tuning hibernate as well do good database design and make sure that there are actually also that's the most important one indexes on the foreign keys ask the design advisor for help if everything else fails and make sure that you've done the proper run stats yourself right so think of the words of dr bob throw in more hardware and it will be consumed as well. 
The last few slides, which is uh, taking too long for, for now, but uh, you can see them in the handout, is how to create a test environment. It just tells you about DB2 look, what you can do with the DB2 look, not only to extract the DDL, but also the statistics, and so on and so on, so you can really mimic uh, an environment, because it is very important that your test environment actually looks like your production. So, that's it for today. If you have any questions, always you can email me. I love to, to have an email conversation with people. It can take one or two days before I come back, but I always come back. I'm really interested to hear what, what keeps you guys busy. And that, I can say, back to Scott again. Thank you very much, Klaus. That was a great presentation. Thank you very much. So that reminds me, <clears throat> I need to ask our last polling question. And that is, did you learn anything today? Excellent. While people vote, uh, we'll remind you to watch replays. We'll put those on the DP2 Night Show. There's lots of links there. Make it easy to find those replays. When the show ends, there'll be a little survey that you can participate in. That's how to possibly win an Amazon gift card. We appreciate your feedback on the shows. Thank you very much to all of our attendees who spent time with us today. And Klaus, thank you for your fantastic presentation. Thank you, Scott, for Close making this possible. And share the results. 100% of our good-looking audience learned something from you today, Klaus. That's nice. Fan that's fantastic. A lot, a lot of good material in there. Well done. Well done. And with that, today's show was sponsored by DBI Software. DBI Software is your trusted partner for breakthrough DB2 performance solutions that deliver invaluable results for organizations having the most demanding requirements and discriminating preferences. There's a webinar this afternoon. Look for it on the DBI events page. Sign up and get paid to learn. And that's it. Klaus, have a good weekend. Everybody else, have a good weekend. Stay safe. Yep. And... Have fun. And remember, too, to take our study, please. The State of the DB2 Universe study. That's at bit.ly slash DB2 study. Okay. Bye for now. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.